partly simplex fire of type 1 in Alzheimer's disease, and some initial experiments, rather than more final ones, with antiviral agents. Um, I'm afraid I have to give rather a lot of background, because the work isn't very well known, and a lot of people aren't very really knowledgeable about viruses, understandably. And in this slide, I'm sure you all know what about, but I just wanted to point out that the major things here are the causes of the sporadic types of Alzheimer's disease, the most common, are unknown. And as are the causes of implant and the fibrillary tangles, the um, main features. Uh, the risk, uh, well, the major susceptibility factor, as you have heard already, is the type 4 area of apolipoprotein E. Um, well, why, you might ask, should a virus be a factor? Why might a virus be a factor in Alzheimer's disease? Uh, well, there are several persistent viruses which can cause neurological disease. The well best known are probably HIV and measles. And um, herpes simplex virus type 1 is implicated because it can latently infect neural, neuronal cells. And once the person is infected, it stays lifelong, like known in the trigeminal ganglia, the peripheral nervous system. And also, it's ubiquitous. Um, and in acute infection, that's the most interesting part, the regions mainly affected in herpes simplex and encephalitis are very similar to those mainly affected in Alzheimer's disease. And uh, survivors of HSE show cognitive and memory and behavioral changes. Uh, I'll just give you a little bit of information about herpes. Uh, as I said, it, uh, a lot of these I've already said, infects most humans in infancy, remains latent in the PNS. Uh, during latency, viral DNA is present. There's one abundant set of transcripts only, and either, well, so far, more or less undetectable viral proteins. What it's doing really is very unclear, uncertain. However, stress, immunosuppression, and so on can reactivate the virus, and when that happens, you get whole viruses formed and you get an acute infection. And uh, on reactivation from the peripheral nervous system, something like 20 plus percent of people develop herpes labialis, cold sores, or fever blisters. But the re remainder show no clinical signs of reactivation, even though they reactivate. Um, and I just want to point out here an important point, which a lot of people perhaps don't think about necessarily. The viruses and other microbes uh, infect far more people than they actually affect. In other words, a lot of people can be asymptomatic even though infected. Um, well, we ask the following question. Firstly, is the virus present in normal brains? Uh, secondly, is it active in brain? Uh, is the virus in brain associated with Alzheimer's disease features? And is there a causal link with neuropathology? Um, Yes, sorry, our results were, um, just to summarise, we used PCR to look at, look for herpes DNA in um, post-mortem human brains. And what we found was it was present in latent form in many elderly, normal, and Alzheimer's disease brains. And we found by looking at um, antibodies to the virus in the CSF that there was evidence that it had reactivated and then replicated there. I could explain that, but it take a little bit of time. The point is it showed that it had reactivated, become an acute infection, possibly recurrently. And we found also that herpes virus in the brain of people who carry an APOE4 allele uh, confers a strong risk of Alzheimer's disease and accounts for about 60% of patients. And very interestingly, we found that APOE4 is a strong risk factor for herpes labialis, cold sores, which um, so we can conclude that in both CNS and PNS, virus damage is greater in APOE4 carriers. Um, I just want to show the side of the slide as uh, really an aside, but we decided as a side issue to look at uh, the effects of APOE in several diseases of known infectious cause, where there was reason to think that APOE might be involved. Again, I haven't got time to explain the rationale, but uh, most of these uh, in fact, all of these are now published. Um, I think the main um, interesting one, perhaps, and the one with the most data, the clearest data, uh, were in the HCV, hepatitis C virus induced liver disease. Totally different virus, totally different disease. And um, in this case, we were very surprised, a bit disconcerted, to find that APOE4 was protective. 
But um, we concluded from all these studies that April is a major factor in determining outcome of infection by certain microbes. And the allium involved probably depends not only on the pathogen or the microbe involved, but also on the cell type. Um, well, I go on now to our more recent work with HSV1 links to Alzheimer's neuropathology. Um, what we found was, to summarize quite a lot of work, that the virus increases levels of, of um, A beta, amyloid beta, and A D like tau. Uh, this is using human neural cells, and we found that using four different antibodies to A beta 142 or A beta 140, immunocytochemistry mainly, also ELISA, that there was an increase in the um, level of these uh, uh, of, of beta amyloid, also increase in the levels of the enzymes responsible for degrading it, uh, amyloid precursor protein to beta amyloid based on nicastrin. Uh, we found also that tau phosphorylation occurred at various sites in tau, um, which I listed here, and um, again we used immunocytochemistry and ELISA and Western blotting. And we found the kinases that were involved increased too. Um, the virus encodes a protein kinase, incidentally, which activates and functionally overlaps cell kinase PKA and it stimulates, I mentioned this before, well, I didn't actually say it, but it's in one of the slides, that it stimulates cells into cycle, but then leads up to G2M, which occurs also in AD. And um, GSK3, incidentally, regulates A beta production. Um, well, the more recent, um, I should have mentioned also that we found that in uh, infected, herpes infected mice in the brain, there was deposition of beta amyloid, which is quite interesting finding, and sort of tallied with the cell culture results. Um, more rec very recently, we looked at, uh, we tried to find out something about the localization of the virus in the human brain. And we did this by taking, looking at sections of post-mortem brain, uh, and looking at them, or using the technique, very difficult technique, in situ PCR, to amplify in, in situ, uh, to detect viral DNA. And also we use thioflavin S, or immunocytochemistry, to look for presence of amyloid or plaques. And um, what we did was we uh, used white light to look for viral uh, DNA, brown stain, and fluorescent light to look, we switched over in the same position in the microscope to look for plaques uh, using fluorescent light calculator S. And as you can see, there's very, very nice uh, coincidence. I'll show you another slide in a moment between the two. Um, this is another section, nothing to do with those, of another brain. And this was done by, again, in situ PCR for the DNA, but um, immunohistochemistry showing purple for um, beta amyloid. Sorry, I don't think the color contrast is very good, but there are, you can see, sort of um, areas within the brown uh, viral DNA uh, of a same for beta amyloid. Um, this is another example of the um, in situ PCR and the same section looked at under fluorescent light for, uh, beta, uh, for plaques. And here, another one, and here. So as you can see, there's very nice co-localization. And we, we wanted to sort of more or less quantify it. It's not very easy to do. But um, just to give you a summary, really, what we found was that about, in the case of the Alzheimer's brain, about 90% on average uh, of the plaques contained viral DNA. And about 72% of the viral DNA was associated with plaques. In the case of the elderly normals, age match normals, about 80%, somewhat lower percentage, which may or may not be significant, uh, associated with um, a plaques contained viral DNA, but a much lower proportion was of the DNA was associated with plaques. 